Hello, namaste, and a very warm welcome to all of you around the world who are listening to this uh, webinar. This is the WSPOS Independent Medical Education Program on Comprehensive Update on Myopia Management. This independent medical education was supported by Asila Laxotica, who is at the gold level supporter, Cooper Vision on bronze level supporter, and Hoya is our silver level supporter. If you look at uh, WSPO's education forum, what is independent medical education? This is the resource for evidence-based educational programming, which has got podcasts, there are e-learning portals, and there are supplements with uh, all the material there. And there are videos on many of the factors, including surgical therapy and other therapies. Today's agenda, we had a fantastic program uh, yesterday, the part one of the webinar for two hours. On the day two, we have, this is our agenda uh, going forward for today. We have fantastic uh, speakers lined up. You, some of you have already sent uh, question and answers, uh, questions for the Q&A sessions. We will answer them as much as possible uh, through these webinars. But to let you know, everyone, there is one exclusive webinar planned at a later date with all the faculty here just to answer the question and answers, which will be notified to you, all of you later. We have uh, experts, as you can see in this uh, picture, the this slide. We have people from around the world who are experts in the field of myopia who is talking. And uh, countries, if you look at the top 10 countries, you can see who are registered and tuning in today as listed in this uh, slide. Uh, we did a WSPS myopia survey data, which was uh, completed by in November 2022. With 11 questions we had, we had 326 respondents from 64 countries. On an average, the respondents see around 29 pediatric myopia patients per month. This is a huge number. You can see around one fourth of the respondents see more than 50 pediatric myopia patients per month. If you look at the, the how is the number of pediatric myopia patients you see in your practice changed over the last five years? Significantly, you can see that it's substantially increased in 50%, marginally increased in 33%. So, most of, more than 80% of the people are seeing more uh, myopia patients. What are the treatment strategies? Behavioral modification and pharmaceutical options are the most common treatment strategies for both the age groups, as you can see in this uh, slide. Now we will go on to the audience response uh, questions. Uh, we have five questions. I would like everyone uh, to answer this, which will pop up in your uh, uh, Zoom. You can see, where do you practice? This is the question. Are you from Europe, Africa, Middle East, Asia Pacific, Indian subcontinent, North America, South America, Australia, New Zealand, and others? So I'm seeing, uh, I, I have answered as, as, it, as well, and I'm seeing, as you are answering, I will give another 15 seconds to answer so that I will know where the people are tuning in from. So as of now, most of the people are from, it's between Asia Pacific, as well as Indian subcontinents, it's varying between 12 to 13%. Next from North America, and then Middle East and Africa, and then South Africa, and then um, others 2%, and Australia and New Zealand, it's late in the night, just one person there. Uh, I'll just, yeah, let's move on. Right now, it's Indian subcontinent, which has maximum number of participants for this session. I'll go on to the next question. 
how many pediatric myopia patients do you see in your practice each month? Zero, one to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 30, 31 to 40. And the last option is more than 50. I'm waiting for the answers here. I will give another 15 seconds for the delegates to answer. So one fourth of the delegates are uh, seeing more than 50% and majority are seeing 60% of them are seeing, you know, between one to 50 patients. And around 25 patients or 25 delegates are seeing between 20 to 40 patients per month. That's the answer for this, and that's the poll answer for this question. Let's move on to the next question. How has the number of pediatric myopia patients you see in your practice changed over the past two years? I substantially increased, marginally increased, neither increased or decreased, or marginally decreased or substantially decreased. I'm looking at the answers. Substantially increased for more than 65% of the people who are joined in today. And marginally increased for 26%. So more than 85% see a lot of patients, uh, which has increased in the last two years. Fourth question of the poll today, how confident are you in your ability to manage and treat myopia progression in a patient younger than eight years? Very confident, somewhat confident, neither or not confident. I will give uh, 15 seconds. Very interesting to see that uh, 62% are somewhat confident. 15% are very confident. Rest of the 15 or 20% are neither confident or neither, uh, not confident at all. So that's the answer we are seeing. Somewhat confident is the answer, which is the maximum. Fifth question, how confident are you in your ability to manage and treat myopia progression in a patient between eight to 12 years. Same answer, options. So let's see what's the result. It, it's almost similar, except that for this question, I see 34% of the people who are tuned in today are very confident, 34%. Now it has come down to 30% and 64% are somewhat confident. The last question of the day, how strong is your understanding of the latest treatment options for myopia management, including bifocals or progressive spectacles or pharmaceutical options? Very strong, strong, moderate, little understanding, no understanding. All right, so 45% of the people have moderate understanding, 30% of the people have strong understanding. Uh, that's the, thanks for answering all these questions. That's the end of uh, first part of the webinar today. Now, let us move on to our first speaker today. This is, uh, we're we going to invite Dr. Ian, Flitcroft, he is a consultant ophthalmologist at Children's University Hospital, Temple Street. He is an adjunct professor of Vision, Technological University of Dublin, and he is also clinical professor of ophthalmology at UCD. He is going to talk about preventing axial length elongation with a pair of spectacles. Can it be done? Over to you, Ian. Uh, many thanks, and I'm delighted to be here, and uh, thanks for the invitation. 
Now, in relation to just disclosures, I do work with a range of companies, but I don't have any direct financial uh, interest in any of the products or treatments I'll be talking about today. So where do spectacles fit in? Um, they are an, certainly an easy win with young children, hesitant families. There's nothing extra elements. There's no eye drops or anything else. Um, we have to also recognize that as well as hesitant families, in our own studies, we've found there's a lot of hesitancy in uh, eye care practitioners, which has resulted in single vision glasses still being the dominant form of correction. Um, it, this also addresses one of the other questions that practitioners have, which is concerns about chair time, number of extra follow-up visits. Um, also, certainly you don't need topography. And I strongly feel that you don't need absolute length measurements to start doing this treatment, though ultimately that's something you should aspire to do as the ideal way of monitoring. Um, and of course, this is not an either or situation. Uh, th these treatments can be combined with pharmaceutical approaches. Um, there are some extra catches. And the main thing is that the, the fitting and the centration is more important for some of the designs, as we'll discuss later. Um, and they can be more expensive, which can be a significant factor, um, especially compared to low vet low power single vision glasses which can be quite cheap in children. So there are a variety of approaches we're going to divide this between uh, myself and Carly Lam so I'm doing the first three which is bifocals progressive ads and one of the new generation which is the highly aspheric lens lit technology um, and Carly's going to do some of the other designs and uh, the defocus incorporated multiple segments which she was involved in developing. So uh, in terms of just lumping together by focals and progressive ad lenses, um, uh, these are relatively inexpensive. They're a very familiar concept. Um, they may have a particularly niche role in relation to binocular vision issues or kids with a combination of lags. Um, in my practice, I use them pretty much exclusively um, in combination with higher doses of atropine where kids might have problems with, with reading. Um, uh, there are some negatives, uh, sporty kids because they're inferior field issues, um, but the fundamentally the efficacy of these approaches is vastly below that of the newer technologies we'll be talking about later. Now the COMET trial, the correction of myopia evaluation trial, was the uh, the grandmother of all myopia trials, um, and those of us involved in the field back then were very uh, hopeful of it. Um, very well designed study, you know, large, well powered, um, with PALs of plus two doctors, um, and there was, there was, these were reported almost 20 years ago now. Um, and this was the first study that showed that optics do indeed control eye growth. Uh, and while it was statistically significant, the problem was that the it was not clinically impactful. So over three years, there was a tiny reduction in progression and a very small amount of, of slowing, most of that in the first year of treatment. Um, though in subgroup analyses, so in terms of binocular vision issues, there do seem to be a, a, group of kids, a group of kids who do have a more increased benefit, like 0.64 doctors over three years, which is still less than the, uh, the best we can achieve with other technologies. So in terms of the um, uh, bifocals, these have come in and out of fashion over 30 or more years. Um, some studies have you know, convincingly shown that there's no effect. Um, other studies have shown there is uh, uh, apparently quite an attractive effect, um, uh, including the effect on uh, axial length. So some of the studies have involved either just by focals or with add-in prisms. Now, this have been superseded by the next uh, generation of uh, treatments. Um, and I'll be talking about the highly spheric lenslet spectacles, um, which as I'll show you have very impressive uh, efficacy and acceptability. Um, uh, I mentioned as a negative that these are more expensive. Uh, one, of the, one of the barriers we found was that in commercial settings, uh, one of the you know, hesitancies was based around you know, the business model for that. And we have to accept in the modern world that if there's a business model, there's more likely to be uh, widespread adoption. So this can be considered uh, as, a, as a profit center, which can be an incentive in certain situations. Um, the pricing is certainly an issue I'm seeing uh, in practice. Um, the way these lenses work, there's no specific reading ad, which means they, um, they're they less suitable um, for mixing with high-dose atropine, but of course they will blend perfectly well um, with low-dose, though that evidence is entirely lacking at present. Um, and there are some visual image quality issues which uh, may be impactful in older children. 
So in terms of the lens design, this is a high refractive index um, uh, lens. And this figure, uh, this correct and control, this is what I, I use this sort of concept when explaining this to, to parents. And it's a really valuable, simple form of communication. This glasses do two things. Rather than just correct, like traditional glasses, they also have this control element. So I say to parents is the correction allows your kid to see and these extra little um, lenslets send a signal to the eye to slow down its growth. And I find that's really quite enough. Um, a few parents want more detail, but it's a very long and detailed conversation, which honestly, I think you can um, circumvent with this kind of communication. Um, these lenses have uh, 11 rings of uh, aspheric designs, which change uh, by the ring. Um, and the key thing about this design is that rather than create a particular plane of focus to control the eye, um, it produces uh, a volume, and that's been matched to the shape of a myopic eye. But the, by, by using a volume, it should allow for the variability of different eyes to be catered for. Now, how should we judge success? Um, Rather than just the trial results, we obviously need to have meaningful impact on refraction axial length. I want to see no rebound on sensations, so don't, don't have to worry about that. Uh, I want to have negative, minimal impact on visual function. But also, uh, at a higher barrier, I want to see evidence that we're actually changing the natural history and looking at the impact on the, on the anatomical consequences of my progression, not just axial length. So the two year studies of this are out and actually the, the third year has also been uh, presented at a conference in the International Mopia Conference. Um, and this graph here, the, there are three, three colors, the single vision in blue, um, and there are two designs, the SAL and the highly spheric lens that, as you can see that the highly spheric lens that had the most impact um, adopter over two years, which is obviously dramatically more than we saw in PALS. And to answer the question at the start of the session is, can it affect axial length growth? The answer is convincingly yes. And again, this the HAL design at the bottom here um, is showing uh, a 60% reduction in axial length compared to the placebo. And that's 0.4 doctors uh, over two years. And that effect appears to be progressing. So we're not seeing the, the first year effect we saw in Comet. And importantly, this efficacy would seem to be independent of gender, age, and degree of myopia. One thing that does affect this is uh, wearing time. This uh, study shows that um, you have to be wearing this you know, more than 12 hours a day. Um, so part-time wear is certainly one of the significant factors that needs to be addressed to get uh, adequate efficacy. Going on to my sort of set of criteria, in terms of rebound effect, a small study in um, Vietnam showed that we're not seeing the rebound effects that we saw with high-dose atropins in the ATOM study. That gives a lot more confidence and flexibility about changing between different modalities, which is a very important part um, of uh, myopia management. In terms of the impact on visual function, um, we're seeing here compared to um, single vision lenses, that high contrast acuity is unaffected and no impact on, on um, the field of view. But what we do see is that um, when looking not through the middle, but through this periphery part of the lenses, that low contrast reading speed is reduced. About 10% is very low, but high contrast reading speed um, is, uh, is unimpaired. Uh, and lastly, in terms of uh, retinal shape, we're also seeing that these lenses do uh, affect and reduce the progressive change in eye shape that we see in my progression. So that really does uh, point to a change of, of the biology of this process. Um, and also choroidal thickness um, as a progression is associated with uh, reducing choroidal thickness with time and in highly uh, myopic eyes, that can be quite dramatic. Um, and these HAL lenses, they're not seeing any change in choroidal thickness over, over the two years. So in summary, um, spectacles are an integral part of any mobile control strategy because kids need glasses to see. But the key thing is that single vision correction is no longer an adequate standard of care to my mind. Uh, my children will be progressing for um, 10 years. So during that time, we need to be able to adapt to their lifestyle. Um, hence, you know, being able to change easily without worrying about rebound is, is important. Um, and the best solution is, is whatever the child uses at that time or a combination thereof. Um, these modern designs have been a real game changer on the basis of their efficacy. And to my mind, they're an ideal starting point and they are my first starting point in, in most children. Um, the caveat is that this technology has been pioneered in Asia 
And we need more studies in European children to look at the question of efficacy, uh, the acceptability and use patterns, and the, the quality of life impact. But a very exciting era to be uh, heading into. Many thanks. Thanks, Ian, for that wonderful uh, talk on um, optical correction, not just using single vision glasses. So now uh, there are many questions coming here. So we will take that question after the next talk. Now I invite Professor Carly Lam. She's uh, from the Center of Myopia Research School of Optometry, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, Hong Kong. She's also affiliated to Center for Eye and Vision Research in Hong Kong. She's going to talk about the same topic of preventing axial elongation with a pair of spectacles. Can it be done? But her focus will be on peripheral diffusion technology and defocus incorporated multiple segment DIMS technology. Over to you, Professor Lam. Thank you. Um... Yes, so um, I'd just like to declare, slides are going too fast. <laughs> I'd like to declare that uh, my research funding from had been sponsored by Hoya for the DIMS lens uh, studies. And the DIMS lens is also co-developed and co-owned with our university and Hoya. So this uh, infographics, uh, is from IMI and it detailed most of the current spectacle options for myopia control. So Ian has covered some and I will cover the remaining few. So we all know that the eye is not a perfect sphere and the retinal shape also may not be spherical. So even though the light rays go through the eye and focus onto the fovea, but the same ray that goes to the peripheral part of the retina may not be on the retinal surface. It could be in front or behind. And so it is this mismatch of the, uh, the mapping of the retina that cause uh, some dis defocus. We use the term defocus. And there have been a mechanism suggested that this peripheral retinal defocus has a significant role in ametropization and refractive error development. So there have been used this term relative peripheral refraction to define the difference between the peripheral refraction and central refraction. So there have been suggestions that traditional correction in myopia using the concave lens actually cause uh, peripheral hyperopic uh, refraction. And it is be beyond the retinal surface and therefore cause um, or arouse extension growth of the eyeball. And this will accelerate myopia progression. So the, the button is very difficult to control. So in this last diagram, there have been attempts trying to uh, reduce this hyperopic defocus or hyperopic refraction so as to match the retinal shape and therefore reduce the chance of myopia progression. So the uh, myovision lens applies this principle and three customized spectacle lens were designed to reduce the hyperopic defocus while maintaining clear central vision. The first 12 months RCT did not show any significant treatment effect. Only the type three lens showed an axial length difference of about 0.09 millimeter comparing with the control group. Another two-year RCT from a Japanese research group also could not verify the therapeutic effect of the myovision lens in slowing myopia progression. And in fact, from these figures on the right, you can see the time course of the change in ocular refraction and also axial length for both the control and the treatment group were more or less the same.
So light diffusion technology have been used to create a clear central zone for distance correction and surrounded by multiple dots that reduce the contrast at the peripheral retina. And this reduction uh, can vary from 30 to 60%. So this light diffusion technology was based on a hypothesis that high contrast signal at the retinal photoreceptors induce the eye to grow while the opposite happens under low contrast. So lenses were designed to modulate this contrast in the peripheral visual field. And uh, the design had been used in uh, this type of lens uh, in three different levels of contrast reduction. So the group claims that optical design uses a non-vergence optics to achieve this contrast reduction. And uh, it was at the photoreceptors level. And this mechanism deviates from the more common one that in, uh, advocates um, as the peripheral retinal defocus hypothesis. So sight glass vision uh, developed this dot lens with using this technology. And at the moment, a three-year double mass LCT uh, is undertaken in 14 sites in US and Canada. So there are two tested lens plus the control lens, so a three-arm trial. And the one-year interim results show that uh, the efficacy was up to 74% compared to the single vision lens group. At the AVO this year, uh, the group presented the two years results and there was a criteria for full-time wearers. And they defined that the subjects whose parent reported that they did not remove the study spectacles for near vision activities, then they would be regarded as full-time wearing of the lens. So out of this criteria, only two thirds of the children fulfilled it. So this table shows the results from the two thirds of the subjects who fulfilled the full-time wear. And from this results, there was only difference between the type one lens group and the control group. That shows a significant uh, change from the baseline of axial length and ocular refraction. And at the presentation, there was no myopia control efficacy calculated. So the DIMS lens uh, is marketed as the mirror smart lens by Hoyer since 2018 and is now available in 28 countries. So it was based on the hypothesis that the natural process of amitropization in human eye are regulated by the equilibrium between the opposite hyperopic and myopic defocus. So this lens corrects refractive error and provide clear vision at all distances and at the same time, the myopic defocus signal uh, was uh, in the mid periphery and distributed in 400 multiple segments of about uh, of 3.5 diopter. So in the two years RCT of the DIMS lens, uh, we found 52% Efficacy in slowing myopia progression, 62% efficacy in slowing the axial length. We move on to the third year. The DIMS group subjects continue to wear the DIMS lens and uh, the annual progression and the axial length changes were very similar in each year. And it was about minus 0.18 diopter and axial length was 0.1 millimeter. And for the control group, because of the positive results, the control group subjects were offered to wear the DIMS lens. So they all changed to the DIMS lens. And from here, you can see that the first two years having single vision lenses, myopia progression and SL elongation were much more comparing to the year when they were on the DIMS lens. We stopped the follow up at 3.5 years due to the pandemic and also some society issues in Hong Kong. 
And we recall the subjects back at uh, the year that they reached six years. And uh, they all come back for uh, the same protocol of measurements. So now we have uh, four groups depending on the type of lens wear and also on the duration of the wear. We found that these four groups has no difference among them in terms of the age at enrollment and the gender proportion. So group one and group two were both from the original treatment group. So in the first 30, 42 months, they were wearing the James lens. And after we stopped the, the follow-up, uh, group one continued to wear James lens and group two changed back to single vision lens. So in here, you can see that um, the, the solid line re represents the group one and overall six years, the myopia progression was minus 0.92 diopter. And uh, in the group two group, it has a little bit more uh, myopia progression. So from this data, the, the group one who have worn the dims then six years, the annual rate was minus 0.15 diopter and 0.1 millimeter for the axial length. And comparing the 2.5 years that they were on the different lens type, dims lens versus the single vision lenses, you can see that uh, the myopia progression is different and more in the group two. And this shows the same pattern for the axial length changes. So at the last 2.5 years, these are the difference between the two groups. Actually, not a lot of difference, but this also shows the children are older now after six years. So X, I mean, the normal eye growth has also slowed down. For group three and four, they were original control subjects. And then they have 1.5 years of dims lens. And when we stop at 3.5 years, group three continue to wear the dims lens. So altogether, they have four years of dims lens wear. And group four change back to single vision lenses. So from single vision, dims, and then single vision more time with single vision, actually. So from here, again, you can see that group three has a much less myopia progression comparing to group four, and likewise in terms of axial length. So th again, the comparison uh, between the two groups are listed here. So this figure is from KIMAC, uh, in 2021, uh, it uh, plotted the, all the axial length uh, changes, annual changes of the different uh, type of myopia control methods, uh, like the DIMS lens, the off -OK lens, multifocal contact lens. And they use uh, the uh, normal uh, eye growth curve from two studies to compare with all these annual changes with the different methods. And what they found is that uh, the DIMS lens, uh, the treated, the, the group that had won DIMS lens for, six, for three years in here, because it's three dots at the time that uh, they used the three years data, had an average axial length growth of 0.1 millimeter per year. And this is actually comparable to the normal uh, physiological eye growth. And they also suggest that 0.1 millimeter per year as a treatment target. So going back to the topic uh, that we were given, so preventing axial elongation with a pair of spectacles, it can be done. So I missed out one slide here is that from the six year data of uh, wearing the dim lens, actually among them, 22% of the children did not have any increase in myopia. And 33% of the children uh, did not have any increase in axial length more than 0.3 millimeter. So from this, I think there are evidence that this can be done. And uh, the current concept that we have covered uh, just now, and but there are also other factors to consider 
So whether this signal uh, that controlled myopia progression, should it be at the peripheral retina or at the central retina? So we still haven't confirmed that. Um, but we also know there is a dose effect and uh, this dose, could, would it be defocus or would it be contrast modulation or would it be something else? We also not, not concluded. So, and the area of proportion between the vision correction and also the stimulus, the, the signal, what is the right ratio is still to be tested. And of course the time. So there have been studies showing that full-time wear, how many hours, and it, it is also an important factor. So from this, we know the mechanism is still to be confirmed. So if our ultimate goal for myopia control is to control uh, the myopia progression to eliminate the, any myopic related pathology, then control of the eye growth is a must. So current use of just the ocular refraction or myopia progression change as an indicator may not achieve this purpose. And there should be a wider use of ocular biometry to ensure a more accurate evaluation of axial length. And, uh, but we also know that the eye growth during childhood is physiological and eye growth is also more rapid at a younger age. So this factor we have to consider and in our calculation of the efficacy or the absolute change. So I believe customized anti-myopia signals and the time use of this device will vary for individuals and likely there will be new products uh, going along this line. So thank you. Thank you, Carly, uh, for that extensive coverage of this uh, dim lenses. Uh, we have some time for questions now. I will take, uh, there are many, many questions on the Q&A session, but uh, I will start with one question for Ian. Uh, do you have in your workup uh, pattern, okay, this patient has relative peripheral hyperopia, and then I will go for uh, this kind of lenses. Do you have a, a kind of workup for these patients when they come and before you select what treatment options of peripheral defocus is better for that patient? Could you elaborate on that, Ian? Now, I mean, going to Cardi's last point, um, uh, based on the trials, I don't measure peripheral defocus and I would not limit that to uh, kids that have perif peripheral hyperopia. Um, when you look at the distribution of um, myopic kids, um, the average is certainly um, hyperopic in the periphery, um, but the distribution is enormously sort of varied. Um, and it doesn't seem that the um, off-axis refraction measured the start of treatment is a predictor. So uh, I don't, th that's an added complication. And I wouldn't say that these, these modern generation lenses should be restricted to kids with proven high probability focus. I think it's you know, the, the trials are there saying this is you know, a, a great starting point. So I, I start and then I just evaluate the response. Now I, I use actual length to do that um, uh, within six to 12 months um, and then take it from there. So I, I don't think you need a complicated workup to start using these lenses. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody else on the panel uh, have any suggestions on workup of these patients with hypermetropia, hyperopia, peripheral hyperopia? Kali, do you have any any comments may, on that? May I, Ramesh? Yes, Paolo, I... go ahead. So, like atropine, the focus lenses do not work in all cases, and possibly the mechanism of atropine and the mechanism of the focus lenses is different. We are striving now to to publish something that uh, shows that both together they have a summation effect. Ian, Carly, do you have the same experience or not? You mean combination therapy? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I know currently the DIMS and uh, atropin study is going on, uh, but the results I, I have not seen yet. 
Yeah, so this is, I mean, there's a lot of interest in, in combination therapy. There's more data in relation to other modalities like orthokeratology and um, uh, atropine. Um, I, I do combine therapies, um, uh, often with a high dose atropine and, and optics. Um, but that's uh, synergism. Uh, is certainly that that will be the, the ultimate sort of goal. But um, uh, evidentially, we have to say the jury is currently out on that. So if you have anything coming out the pipeline, that would be great to see that. Yeah. Let's come back to the spectacles uh, here. Uh, I had one more question uh, for Ian. Uh, you commented that whenever there is a near esophoria kind of situation, you would go for peripheral uh, the PF files or executive bifocals. Do you still practice these kind of lenses in selected patients of uh, you know group of patients, especially when they have a accommodative lag or near esophoria? Yeah, I, mean, I think if you can show that there's going to be a positive benefit from a binocular vision. Um, perspective. Um, I think it's worth worth considering. Um, as I mentioned, I, I, I use progressive ad lenses um, in older kids uh, with uh, as a combination with high dose atropine, where they, they, we are, I'm expecting to have some accommodation or reading difficulties, because I, I have a sort of a once a week 1% regime that I use as my backup. So um, I think if you are, you know, and some practices are very sort of into the, the BV aspects of this. So that's the either combination with hydrous atropine or you know, usefully beneficial impact on binocular vision are my only justifications for using PALS. Um, uh, they're still actually quite commonly used for people to say, look, I mean, I'm using my control, but in, outside those two indications, I don't think they have any useful contribution. All right, thank you. Uh, there is a question on the Q&A. Uh, is the quality of vision good with new defocus technology spectacles which have been launched in Europe has it been studied in a large number of children it's been um the I don't know, so the, the SLO lens design has been studied uh, they've used optical quality in adults because they're, they're easier to measure um uh, into, I have quite a few kids in, in these lenses now and and they, they really don't they don't mind and as everybody who deals with kids and their kids their glasses um their glasses are usually smeared and covered in muck anyway so younger children in particular are gloriously oblivious to you know minor degradations um and as an adult when you put the glasses on you're thinking yeah that's, that looks it doesn't look quite right but kids really don't notice them you know one of the unanswered questions is will older kill kids you know, have that issue um carly how do you find your compliance with little people Oh, they they have a little bit of blur at the start, but a cup about maybe up to two weeks, they're all fine. Okay. And compared to the sight glass lens, which showed that you know thirty percent of kids we you know weren't wearing for reading, which tells you that you know reading is difficult with those glasses. Um, yeah. I don't think the dims or the um, Deleste designs. You know, I'm not seeing that kind of issue at all. Well, actually, for kids that are having problems, we also uh, give them advice that they could, you know, dip their head to use the central distance correction. And uh, after a while, when they get used to this and they're more used to this uh, slightly blur mid periphery, then they can they can just you move their eyes. So it is an adaptation process. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think there are many questions on the Q and A. Uh, I just want to uh, tell the delegates that. We have a separate webinar for question and answer session with the same faculty at a later date. We will be able to answer all of these questions. Just before going, one quick question I'll take. Can we go for hall or dim spectacles without documented progression in the very first visit if there is a family history of myopia? Ian and Carly, quick comments. Uh, I would say yes. Um, in sense, if if you've got a uh, a proven low low myo in the family history of kids, you've got a very high percentage of progression. Um, and progression doesn't have to be documented; it can just be history. I mean, could you see clearly a year ago? Are you blurry now? To my mind, is evidence of progression. Carly, yeah. So I'm from me? Asia, where eighty percent of the kids are myopic. So <laughs> going for it is. 
a more reasonable option. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll come back to the question again. There are so many questions there. We will come back to it. Uh, we will move on with the next talk by Dr. Shawil Leo from Adult Pediatric Eye Specialist Private Limited at the Mount Elizabeth Medical Center, Singapore. She's going to talk about the science behind pharmacological modulation for myopia control. Over to you, Shawi. Thank you, Ramesh. So I'm going to talk about pharmacological um, modulation for myopia control. So as we know, atropine eye drops is a non-selective muscarinic antagonist. It's been used for myopia control for a long time now. We do not exactly know its mechanism of action, even though we know for sure it's non-accommodative. So how does it actually work? There are different hypotheses. It's either through a neurochemical cascade, which begins with the retina, or directly on the sclera via non-masculinic mechanism. Whatever it is, we definitely do know that atropine encompasses a complex interplay with receptors on different ocular tissues at multiple levels. The dose-dependent inhibitory effect on myopia progression has been well documented. Um, there's been lots of studies done. The low dose includes 0.01% to 0.1% with reported efficacy of 30 to 65%, whereas the high dose, as we expect, has a greater efficacy of 60 to 80%. When we talk about high dose, we are referring to 0.5 to 1%. These are various studies done a lot in Asia, some in um, Europe and North America too. I'm going to touch briefly on the landmark um, um, studies. The first is the ATOM-1, which was done in Singapore, where we showed that 1% atropine nightly in one year reduces myopia progression by 77%. The atropine group's axial length remains unchanged as compared to elongation in the control group. However, as expected, atropine 1% causes medriasis, resulting in photophobia, and cycloplegia, resulting in decreased near vision. That's why kids on 1% atropine meets photochromatic progressive additional lenses. A follow-up on these participants shows that the effect was totally reversible after stopping the eye drops. Unlike adults, kids adapt to atropine and uh, progressive additional lenses very quickly. Um, they, they use it very well, and these are pictures of early participants. However, after two years of atropine 1%, there was a rebound. And um, atom 2 was done to actually look at the other concentrations, 0.5%, 0.1%, and 0.01%. As again, it showed that lower dosage was less effective, but also has less rebound. So much so that after three years, which means two years on and one year off, atropine 0.01% landed up as the best concentration in these trials. Um, the lowest concentration, 0.01%, also had negligible effect on accommodation, pupil size, and near visual acuity. There was a minimal side effect while re retaining comparable efficacy. So this is an important chart where we look at the combination of ATOM1 and ATOM2 studies. To go through it, the first 24 months, there is a definite dose response where myopia was slowed significantly much more by 1%, 80% um, compared to 60% at 0.01%. However, when the treatment was stopped for a year, there was a greater rebound with the higher atropine um, concentrations. After that, the progressors were actually um, restarted on 0.01%. And as a result, after five years at 60 months, um, the change in spherical equivalent was the least in atropine 0.01%. There was a change of minus 1.4 diopters, which is actually the same in the placebo group in a much shorter time, in two and a half years. To address the problems, um, the questions left unanswered by Atom, the LAMP study was done to look at specifically at the lower concentration, 0.05%, 0.025%, and 0.01%. They showed significant reduction in spherical equivalent with, um, with uh, comparable changes in axial length, with greatest effect in the 0.05%. In the second year, when the control group was switched to 0.05%, the efficacy of 0.05% and 0.025 remained similar, with improvement in the effect of 0.01%. Uh, 
overall, the pupil size, um, different changes and the change in accommodation was minimal, resulting in no big problem. Of note, there are certain differences between the LAMP results and ATOM results. Um, the LAMP um, participants were actually younger and showed a greater effect in 0.05%, with a much less effect in 0.01% compared um, to the um, ATOM study. So overall, after three years, we can see definitely there was dose response, with 0.05% being the best concentration. We also know that um, stopping treatment at an older age and lower concentration were associated with a smaller rebound. Interestingly, the recently published Western Australia ATOM study showed much more modest myopia control with the 0.01%. And ex possible explanation is that there is a much higher dropout rate. Another um, interesting fact was that children of European um, ancestry actually derived greater benefit than those Asian children, which was different from previous results. Um, there has been lots of conflicting evidence for axial length um, elongation inhibition in 0.01%. Although uh, a recent meta-analysis showed that actually there was still significant. And overall, a recent network meta-analysis actually um, ranked 1%, 0.5, and 0.05% as the three most beneficial for myopia control. And if you actually assess for overall progression by relative risk, 0.05% was the most beneficial concentration. So in my practice, I'm lucky that I have access to all sorts of different concentration and in different formulations, both preserved and preservative free. We do have to talk about non-responders. Even in ATOM 1, with 1%, there was more than 10% uh, patients who'd, who progressed. And in ATOM 2, there were different ranges with about 10% on 0.01%, which still progressed. So as for side effects, I would say with the atropine, there was minimal, um, there was allergy, 1% to 4% glare, especially in the higher concentration, and loss of accommodation in the higher concentration as expected. In the LAMP studies, 30% needed photochromatic glasses, very few needed reading at. In ATOM 2, 70% of the 0.5% actually need progressive uh, with uh, uh, photochromatic lenses. So I will say that atropine eye drops is definitely evidence-based clinical practice. When do we start? When there's doc documented progression. However, um, we have to take special note if they are young and have high myopia with uh, a lot of risk factors, you don't want to wait too long for the to start. What do we start with? We start with higher dose if it's a higher risk case, and we always warn parents about non-responders. It is important to monitor with both cyclorefraction and axial length, aiming for a difference between an uh, older and a younger child. As we know, the younger the child, they are expected to have more axial elongation per year. So usually to explain to the parents, I show them growth charts. It's like growth charts. So you look at the percentile curve. If your child, it's a very low percentile, that means they are higher risk and they need to be started earlier. So there are different percentile curves for axial length and refraction in different populations that we can show the parents. I would say, when do we stop? When the child is older, more stable, I would taper and I do not stop abruptly. Um, as in all um, eye drops, that especially in pediatric patient administration can be challenging. In the pipeline now, there's also microdose formulation of atropine um, that will allow it to be much easier for the child to self-administer atropine. So I would say to conclude, atropine is the most researched pharmacological treatment for myopia control. It is effective even at different dosages but we do have to remember that patients may need different dosages at different periods of their lives. While we await more research to differentiate between non-responders versus responders, we would also like to look at more results from combination therapy, which is the most exciting phase in myopia control. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Shawi. It was an excellent overview of uh, pharmacological treatment. Now we have uh, some time for panel discussion on the pharmacological modulation of myopia control. Just to begin, uh, kick off the discussion, I just would like to ask, uh, uh, you know, the first question. You said 
anger the age, family history of myopia, higher the myopia, you will start them on higher dose. Do you have any specific indication to start 0.01% versus 0.05%? Can you elaborate on that? Um, I mostly start with 0.05% now. Actually, I use 0.01 only if almost like a pre myop like they, they, their, the siblings were already on, on atropine and they are just starting like, you know, they're on full up with me for something else and they're almost like a pre myop they, they suddenly became minus 0.5. So it's really um, for those very low risk cases that I use 0.01. The higher risk cases will use higher concentration. Anybody else on the panel uh, have any other suggestions? Any other recommendations? So Celia, with, okay, so Paulo, with, go ahead. Yeah, uh, my, my point is different. I use the higher percentage in younger children because they accept it very much. While I use a lower concentration in older children because I think that 0 0.05 can create some problems in, in vision uh, for, for near vision. It isn't, it, it, since your your opinion also, or, or, or don't you have this uh, this uh, view? Um, actually, with a zero point zero five percent, I haven't found much problems with the decrease in accommodation. As in the lamp study, I think anything that you that decreases your accommodative amplitude by less than three diopters is it's really quite manageable. Um, we haven't really had to give any ad for the zero point zero five percent. Um, in, my, in my slide earlier, I showed this growth chart that is almost like a growth chart, the percentile chart. So I would, if the child, because they will go by age and the refraction. So if it's a young age, but a higher degree, that means your, your, your percentile chart is very, very low, then yes, I could even go a higher concentration. Uh, so you could have like a five-year-old with a minus three, then of course you have to start with a, a higher, much higher concentration. So we actually look at the chart to explain the, to look at the, to, to profile the, the patient. Any the other comment? Uh, see, see, see. Uh, Go ahead. Go ahead, Ian. Yeah. Oh, um, so I use charts too. So in the sense that if I'm, you know, young child, you know, and they have a, you know, twenty three point five millimeter eye, but they're six years old, you project that forward. And if they're projecting to be as an adult without treatment um, beyond twenty six millimeters, so in the high myopic range, um, I, I will go for maximum treatment. Um, I use one percent. I said I have this sort of a variation where I, to minimize the effects, I use one percent on Friday nights. So by by Monday morning at school, they're they're okay. Some of them do require um, very focals or, or bifocals, um, but it's the ones that you know I'm projecting to be high myopes. Um, I will tend to, as I in my terms, sort of throw the kitchen sink at. So I mean, starting aggressively early in any kid projected to be a high myope, I think, is a very rational approach. Yeah, and also I use the charts to show them that along the way they should improve in their percentiles um, to treat and also to to monitor. Okay, thank you. Celia, do you have any suggestions? Uh, yeah, uh, 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 if, uh, I use um, uh, um, 0 0.025 percent. Uh, I, I decrease my, my patient with uh, 0 0.01 percent. And uh, no one um, has uh, have uh, complained about uh, um, blurred vision for for near uh, and uh, uh, um, photophobia also because we have uh, um, uh, sunlight uh, here in Brazil and uh, we didn't have any problem. I don't have any problem with uh, the concentration of uh, zero point zero twenty five percent. And also, right. no one uh, uses um. um um, mute, mute focal for for you. Um, sometimes I use um, different concentrations on different days. That means the day before 
you know, the night before they have a lot of physical activities, the next day they use a lower concentration and they use a higher concentration on other days when, you know, the day before that they are not going to go as somewhere sunny. Um, so that, and, and the other thing is in patients who do not have access to lower concentrations, they will use a higher concentration, but not every day, you know, in reduced frequency. Uh, excuse me. Uh... Um, I, I have um, now uh, my patients with uh, stylist, they are returned, they are coming, but uh, uh, it, uh, also it's, uh, uh, st it, it's still few patients, but uh, most of my patients, uh, they use uh, atropine and uh, I prescribe the stylist. Uh, <clears throat> do you have any experience about uh, um, um, which is better, um, 0.01% when you combine with uh, this kind of uh, uh, lenses? Uh, that, I mean, that, that, um, there's no, the, the results of the proper trials are not out yet, but personally I have, because I only use the new spectacle lenses for older kids, like the older ones, they tend to be milder, so we can combine the low concentration with whatever myopia control lens that they are on. Um, because the younger kids, I don't start them on the myopia control lenses. It's only those more than eight that we use them. And I'm also, I was also actually like to ask Carly because my understanding is that your DIMS lenses, it's gonna have the photochromatic version soon. Could you, do you have any information of that? Because I think that would be very useful for patients who are on atropine plus dim lenses to have the photochromatic option? Yes, uh, it is uh, coming probably early next year or around springtime. Just to want to clarify here. Uh, so whenever you're combining the treatment like Hall or DIMS, it's better to have a lower doses or lower concentration of atropine. That's correct, right? Just yes. want to make sure that we are on the same line. So yes. I just want to I just want to uh, have a question for all the faculty here. Uh, what should be the first line of treatment in a myopia management in less than eight years? Is it specially designed spectacles or low concentration of petrochemical? Is it? It's a it's a general question. Uh, it's it depends upon the uh, you know socioeconomic status and other things. So, what is the preference of the panel here? We'll start from Kali. I have to declare I'm an optometrist. I cannot use atropine. So, my first choice would be spectacle lens and then contact lens and then also K lens, because you are talking about a quite young age. Any other opinion, uh, Ian? Yeah, and I would. I am now starting with um, optics because it's it's simple, easy to tolerate. Kisney glasses, um, anyway. Um, uh, and in Europe, you know, there, there are no licensed low dose preparations, which is why I use the high dose uh, intermittently. Um, so as, as a starting point, I think that the ideal starting point. Um, the percentages are also misleading. Carly alluded to it that. Um, is not that every kid gets 60%. It's actually quite easy to tell the responders from the non-responders because there's about two thirds of kids who really are very stable in these lenses. And then a, a subset who then will progress. And they're the ones I will consider yeah. for, for further treatments as a second step. So I, I yeah. start with optics and I'll start with glasses in an eight year old Irish kid for sure. Mm. Well, that's interesting, Ian. Uh, if you look at the world, uh, it, it, it's not available everywhere else. And at the same time, if atropine is cheaper, even the different concentrations are not available everywhere. So in that point, in that specific point, any one of you increase the frequency of uh, uh, installation instead of OD to BD? Is there any, uh, you know, 0.01% is available in most of the countries. Do you consider that mode of treatment as one of the modalities? Paulo, I'll begin with you. Yeah, I lost a few words that you said, but my position is completely different from Ian. I start with atropine from the beginning, even before glasses. 
So after a while, I do uh, associate usually the, the, the focus lenses. But my first treatment is atropine. It works is without any cost. It's, uh, it's true that in Europe, we do not have still the, the, the eye drops ready and we have to go to the drugstore for having the, 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 the eye drops. But at the same time, is so easy to, to treat and parents, if you explain very well what you are doing, they are really uh, very adherent to the therapy. So my position is to start with atropine and then to move to the focus lens. And also I have a huge experience with both in three years co combined therapy with an increase in the, in the effect of both together. Mm. Good. I also tend to start with atropine, especially the younger kids, because the trials for the uh, myopia control lenses were done for older kids. I've also had younger kids who told me they don't like the myopia control lenses because the moment they move, they feel that it's very blurry. Like, you know, the moment they move their eyes, that mid peripheral blur. I have had, I've heard complaints. Celia, what's your take on that? Do you start um, on atropine or optical? For, for less than uh, uh, five years, I prefer atropine, but uh, for um, over uh, six, in, including six years old, I prefer non-invasive uh, treatment, but uh, I um, sometimes depends on the, the magnitude, the, how faster uh, is the, the progression. So I prefer atropine, but um, now with, uh, uh, Stylus to dim, uh, 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 and uh, dims lens. Uh, I think uh, I I I I show I present to pay to parents um, the options and uh, uh, we choose uh, together. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think in this panel, if I look at it, sixty percent are towards starting some kind of pharmacological treatment. 40 to 50% are towards optical. I just wanted to share my experience here in our myopia center. What we do is uh, we look at the age, lifestyle, family history, all that is taken. In addition to that, we definitely consider whether there is an accommodative lag. And we try to do an open field refraction for everyone. And if there is a definite kind of relative peripheral hyperopia, it can vary from as Ian said, it can vary from patient to patient. If there is a severe peripheral hyperopy, then our choice is more towards optical. Otherwise, I, I'm just keeping the cost aside here, just the cost factor aside. We start, uh, uh, you know, we will start uh, some kind of uh, treatment uh, in terms of atropine. So. That's the kind of uh, summary at this point of time. There are some more questions on uh, combination therapy, and uh, we will uh, we will get to that after this. Uh, we will go to the third part at this point of time, and then uh, come back to more questions. So part three of the the webinar today is strategies for integrating myopia management into the practice. So this is looking at the reviewing the latest WSPF's guidelines. I need uh, Showay's help here. Uh, we looked at in 2022, very recently, the WSPF's myopia consensus uh, statement. Uh, just give me a second. Yeah. In 2016, almost uh, six, six and a half years ago, we came up with the very nice statement uh, for, you know, at that time there were a limited amount of strategies to delay or reduce the progression of uh, myopia. And we came up with the, uh, which was uh, downloaded many times and many of the patients and some of the, the institute used to give this as a handout to the patients and uh, the discussion used to become easier. We really looked at it in 2022, we, when we have more options at this point of time. 
The methodology I just would like to uh, explain here, the lead authors completed the first draft. I'll come back to who are all the lead authors uh, in the next slide. And then it went to executive bureau of members of WSPOS uh, advisory board. And then once the uh, suggestions are incorporated, the draft is sent to all the scientific and connectivity bureau members of WSPRS. Again, uh, executive bureau met virtually and then made appropriate changes in incorporating the suggestions by everyone. And then the final draft, after all these suggestions were sent out to WSPRS membership, and then comments were uh, you know, taken from the members, and then, if appropriate, it were uh, they were incorporated. The lead authors for this WSPS consensus statements were uh, Dr. Kianti Darzman from Indonesia, Savlin Kaur from India, Dr. Shiove Leo is here, and also Dr. Ken K. Nishchal from UK. These were the lead authors. And uh, in this slide, you can see the immediate advisory board for the virtual meeting where we discussed this uh, first draft. And then the preliminary, the, the happened via email preliminary with the WSPS scientific bureau members and also connectivity. Totally there are uh, uh, close to 40, 45 people in this uh, bureau. They gave all the suggestions, and then the entire WSPS membership, uh, it was sent out as an e-blast, and the deadline was given so that uh, the delegates could uh, get back. So I just want uh, Shawe to tell us what is new compared to 2016 here. I will advance the slide for you. You can uh, uh, speak about it. Over to you, Shori. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to first lay out that uh, what we were trying to achieve was a consensus statement. It's like kind of like agreement where we look at all the data, we evaluate it, synthesize it so that ultimately we need to come to an agreement so that we can advance our understanding and treatment of the disease. It is different from a research kind of meta-analysis where we're using statistical method to run through the results. Okay. So um, we looked at um, the studies that have um, that were critical or that were more important, um, especially those that were more than 100 subjects and more than one published paper that had happened since um, the last, uh, last draft in 2016. So uh, what is new? We acknowledge that while long-term data to show that reduction of axial length related myopia does not exist yet, uh, you would... I'm not sure how feasible it is to do that kind of very, very long-term data. The theoretical benefit is definitely strong enough for us to, to intervene to, um, to reduce myopia progression. So we try to do the same thing. We simplified it to what appears not to work and what appears to work. Um, the, it, is, um, it is quite evident what does not work. You know, the pinhole glasses, the old sort of normal, um, uh, normal glasses, um, it, and that, that, is, that does not need to be covered here, but I'm just going to concentrate on what appears to work. From COVID, from the COVID lockdown, we have had a lot more evidence on the essential um, behavior interventions that are needed. There should be much more reduced time on near task to protect um, myopia, myopia and also to increase outdoor time. The newer spectacle lenses were as, as covered today were also talked about in our statement um, we talked about the dims and the hot technology lenses and we also talked about the newer contact lens design so these are not your typical multifocal we're talking about the soft dual focus uh, multifocal lenses and um, that had the same effect and uh, also we touched about atropine so compared to then now we had a lot more um, lot more data on the different dosages of atropine. Um, we also touch about the effect of autokeratology as well under um, contact lenses. So I would say that um, it, to conclude, if you look at our statement, we did 
um, talk about what works and what not works, but you have to remember that these are just related to your normal sort of um, progressive myopia. We are not talking about the evidence in cases of pathological myopia due to connective tissue disease, retinal dystrophies, ROP, and post-op myopia, because that is a, we feel that it's a different, different pathologies. Yeah. Thank you, Shori. Uh, basically what we did is, uh, this is a statement for eye care professionals, be it optometrists, be it, uh, you know, ophthalmologists or other eye care professionals. What a manuscript which is available, you know, with uh, all the things. There are more than 100 references. When we consider the reference, we, we looked at the level of evidence each of this, uh, you know, giving. As you all know, a lot of animal studies have been done before these, the, you know, level one studies were done in human beings. So only uh, papers which have this uh, level one evidence has been taken into consideration. Obviously, newer and newer therapies are coming as we are talking on November 20th, 2022. Even today, there are some papers coming. I just wanted to uh, go to the next slide. Uh, probably the interventions to reduce the progression of myopia. I just want uh, Shawe to explain what has been uh, done and what has been incorporated in the 22 statement. Go to Shawe. Okay, so like I briefly alluded to just now, it's quite clear cut what does not work under, and, and so these, it's also to tell the eye care professional not to advocate these anymore. So under correction, pinhole glasses, blue light blocking glasses. Okay, um, for bifocal glasses, we meant it as it does, it's not used to control myopia per se. And it's used like, uh, you know, in those cases that need it, like your, uh, those on atropine or, or those with esophoria. And um, your regular daytime single vision soft contact lenses also do not have much effect on myopia control. Uh, we wanted to stress the ones that work, um, behavior interventions to increase time spent outdoors and to reduce time on um, near work, uh, smartphone, near digital devices. Under optical measures, we covered spectacle lenses, contact lenses, and autokeratology. Uh, we wanted to emphasize the, the newer, these are the newer uh, specialized sort of optical treatment. And again, like I said earlier, pharmacological treatment included all the different sorts of concentrations of atropine. Thank you, Shovey. Uh, basically, we have classified them into what appears to work in terms of pharmacological treatment as we discussed. And also we have summarized What's the role of spectacle lenses, different special spectacle lenses, contact lenses, and orthokeratology? Additionally, not to forget the behavioral interventions. So all of them are in a document of three to four pages, uh, including references. There are additional pages, but we have uh, we have uh, you know reduced them uh, you know as a printable format so that all references at one place. It can be as a hyperlink. So that work has been done uh, uh, in terms of consensus statement. So this is already circulated uh, to everybody. All of you should have uh, received it. Some of you will, uh, wouldn't have received who are not the members of uh, WSPS, but this will be uh, you know, fine-tuned with all the discussion together and it will be download, uh, available for downloading after December 6th of 2022. As of 2022, we have collected whatever data is there in terms of caring of our children with progressive myopia, how we can uh, help them in a concise statement. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Shawi. Uh, we will uh, move on to the next uh, session. Uh, we have time for uh, discussion at the end. I will get back to all the questions. And uh, before that, we will go to uh, the next talk by Professor Paolo Nucci. He is the chairman of the University of Eye Clinic at the San Giuseppe Hospital, University of Milan. 
he's going to talk about managing your professional network for early intervention. Over to you, Paula. So let me apologize, uh, Ramesh, because this is not an evidence-based talk, but uh, it's just my way to see the things that are very confused. And today I will go back home with <laughs> other confused idea. So uh, first of all, let me thank uh, WSPOS to invite me at this uh, Myopia Management Symposium. I wish to disclose my conflict of interest, but nothing of what uh, I will mention is uh, in any way related to the, my present contracts. My goal today is to draw your attention to a more technical aspect. Uh, how do we manage our professional network in order to get the most from an early intervention? An effective strategy comes from uh, I would say intense and widespread myopia awareness activities that is proposed at various levels in the context of ophthalmological and pediatric conferences, through newspapers, or through traditional media during the prime time big audience national news, or also through TV shows dedicated to health, or again, uh, through social networks and uh, uh, possibly even in comics. Yet a consistent activity, at least in my country, includes a clear message to all the doctors and the patients, the, stressing the role of pediatric ophthalmologists as competent and dedicated scholar in the field of myopia management. The rest is done by word of mouth. One of the relevant aspects is to obtain a timely referral of patients according to the idea that myopia treatment should start as soon as we can. Even if we must keep in mind that very early myopia correction could, uh, I stress the term could, as reported by old scholars, carries a certain risk of being the trigger to start the evolutive uh, process. The message relating to early referral must concern all myopic children under the age of 16, uh, but also the very small ones under four who do not present the so-called protective hyperopia. In other words, when they are not farsighted, Perhaps in a myopic family, during the first visit, the eye doctor must include a myopia awareness message, stressing three points. The first, that the, the entire world has been gripped by an unprecedented rise in myopia. Second, that myopia should not be considered an innocent condition. And third, that we now have therapeutic possibilities. I believe that an appropriate awareness campaign is also the first step and most powerful tool in the process of ensuring that the patient does not get lost in the referral process. Nevertheless, I think it is also very important to boost a customer loyalty program spending more time educating parents about this issue, avoiding terrorism but being proactive. In the last year, I choose to send voice messages uh, uh, to other caregivers because I believe that the direct verbal communication is the best way to open a channel uh, with other health professions. This has been in my hand very effective in enforcing the relationship and producing an active participation to our care protocol. Another significant activity is asking parental feedback, building a mail calendar. And last one humble suggestion, never call parents for missing appointments for two reasons, because it does not work and also creates a sense of discomfort and pressure. 
uh, only in very few cases, this is an effective method to improve adherence. The common strategy I use since five years is that just at the beginning of any routine visit in our myopia center, because we have a myopia outpatient clinic, there is always a moment dedicated to informative videos just before seeing the patients in which we introduce some rules we will follow. For example, that we will not prescribe glasses for very light myopia. Again, that atropine treatment can well be the first line in treatment even before prescribing glasses and that we do not encourage frequent follow-ups. During the video presentation, we also strongly recommend outdoor activity for 40 minutes a day. And that is the time and we also take the possibility after the recommendation to clarify our negative attitude toward bizarre alternative indications that they may encounter in unfiltered social. And by the way, if I can specifically mention something, I say aloud that the best source of red light is sunlight. After the visit, we discuss tables that we explain our approach and also the reason for a certain reluctance toward orthokay, stressing the efficacy, but also that in our opinion, cannot be considered a totally physiological approach. Physiologic approach. Anyway, we have contact lens specialists that could offer that type of therapy. In all children, we perform retinography and ultrasound, but in myopic patients, we add a biometry and a topography using a dedicated platform. Last point uh, someone addressed before is, uh, and I wish to address with you, is uh, the common question from parents, patients, and colleagues. Are there other than school myopia youngsters worthy to be treated with new myopia therapies. I do not believe that the therapy of myopia uh, is gen in genetically determined conditions such as Marfan or marshall stickler syndrome has any indication. Those are conditions in which fibrillin or collagen genes are involved and I do not see through what mechanism atropine or the focus lenses could work. Can you go back, please? While I would find reasonable to treat myopic shift of the aphakic baby, considering that aphakia is the paradigm of a posterior defocus. In other words, if we concur with the idea that posterior defocus is the main stimulus to ocular growth, we should agree with this proposal. I'm deeply convinced that young Afaki patients can reasonably benefit of the focus treatment. Unfortunately, we are still waiting the focus lenses for higher power defect. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Paulo, for taking that different talk but it's a very very important talk for all of us because as eye care professionals we optometrist ophthalmologist orthoptist pediatricians we have to work together to decrease that progression of myopia it's not that individual effort we all have to work together so that we build a network and they understand what needs to be done for that particular child. So let's move on to the next talk by Dr. Celia Naknami. She's going to talk about uh, best practices for patients education. She is the chair of pediatric ophthalmology and low vision, Federal University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. She's also a council member of the Brazil Society of Pediatric Ophthalmology. Over to you, Dr. Celia Naknami.
Uh, can you please? Sorry, sorry. Okay. Thank you, right. Hamesh. Uh, I, I'd like to thank you, WSP West. Uh, it's my conflict of interest. Uh, well, uh, my opinion is increasing, and even WHO um, is facing the myopia uh, worldwide, like uh, the development of uh, a myopia education program to monitor in large scale population worldwide. And uh, this is the uh, I care practitioners are key influencer for the use of myopia control intervention. Um, shows how much parents trust in uh, eye care professionals to take eye care of their children. Since the onset of myopia is getting earlier, uh, parents' education regarding myopia knowledge, attitude change to get uh, uh, healthy life habits is essential part of the myopia control and uh, will contribute for good vision throughout the child's life. Uh, so we do need the engagement of parents in the myopia control, as well as their uh, awareness. So uh, uh, And um, how to educate uh, both uh, uh, parents and uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, um, patients. Uh, well, uh, most of us initially we communicate to parents that their child has myopia and uh, it tends to progress. But but uh, a long talk about how uh, and why their child has myopia must be carried out. Uh, so we have to give them the most. Uh, uh, in this initial uh, conversation, we have to give them the most relevant data and information, speaking in a simple and clear way, uh, using um, is uh, to understand language, avoiding scientific terms, showing illustrative examples. And we can provide them educational material such as uh, folders, videos for more information. And uh, I think, uh, it's important, don't overload them uh, with too much information. Uh, sometimes it's worth to take enough time in another um, follow-up appointment. Uh, and depends on the child's age and maturity, be careful to not care the, uh, scare the child with uh, words like blindness and lifelong uh, um, um, uh, vision loss. So uh, the information that should be provided and discussed with parents must be uh, a, a clear concept of myopia and uh, related issues uh, as excessive eye elongation, high myopia, the lifestyle risk factors associated with myopia. And you can use easy, simple examples, for, ex uh, for example, uh, to understand based on evidence such as what happened after COVID-19 lockdown. That means the increase in year work and the uh, time screen, the less time spent outdoor and the sunlight exposure worsening the myopia prevalence. Um, we, we can use uh, uh, for this conversation, we can follow uh, um, some uh, guidelines that are already that uh, already exists, like uh, uh, by International Myopia Institute or uh, resolutions and the recommendations by um, uh, uh, eye care uh, professionals, societies. So, uh, all these matters must be discussed with parents. It's better to start the treat to, 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 to inform uh, that it's better to start the treatment as early as possible. And uh, emphasize that today technology allows uh, several safe and effective interventions to retard myopia, uh, myopia progression, although there is a long way 
to go with a few years to follow up. Uh, also discuss that not all patients will respond to treatments and the combined therapy is a possibility. And in most countries, most treatments are still of label use. Uh, and also this uh, baseline exams and data should be obtained. Uh, in the management of myopia, we should talk to parents about uh, to carry out the follow-up physics each six months. That includes uh, and, uh, undergo to regular exams that are re refraction examination under cyclopedia, uh, optical biometry. Remember, it's uh, the gold standard exam to control the actual lens growth. Uh, that's not always covered by private health insurance and also corneal topograph. Uh, we have to explain the patient uh, that the patient will be monitored until the myopia progression stabilizes uh, around uh, 15 years old in 50%. And it's need it's needed to talk about costs to avoid dropping out the treatment. Uh, So uh, this study uh, reveals that parents are indifferent to their uh, children's myopia, and many of them uh, are unaware of the impact of visual blurring on their children's day life. Uh, here we need we, here we have to sensitize them by showing them how a nearsighted the child sees. So uh, keep in mind two things then and talk to them. One, to control, the control of myopia depends on the optical prescription and the uh, children's behavioral habits. And uh, so these parents' attitude puts in risk the goals of myopia management proceed, proposed. And two, as parents are the biggest influencers of their children, they can increase the children Compli children's compliance with uh, the treatment. So parents' education uh, is crucial. Uh, parents must be understand that the strategies of myopia management program, that means understand its goals, the proposed intervention to retard the, the progression, not to stop the eye growth because the child is growing up. Uh, engagement of parents and patients to keep healthy lifestyle, lifestyle habits important. The initial treatment could be changed if uh, it failed or uh, it could be combined with uh, other different ones. Um, a rebound effect may occur after stop the treatment. Uh, the child uh, must be treated until myopic progression um, and the ocular elongation stabilize that uh, and uh, the child must be monitored after stop the treatment. Uh, one of the best ways to face it is to provide um, appropriate and easily uh, understandable documentation. This is the part of uh, it's important uh, to uh, clarify all details uh, about the management um, uh, uh, myopia and uh, provide parents with educational material um, and by the non-commercial websites that you further clarify them. Uh, for regions and countries where some treatments are not approved by the local authorities, all explanation must be presented and uh, the informed consent should be provided and uh, required as treatment. So uh, by presenting uh, and discussing all different treatments currently available and the red presented by our colleagues in this webinar, uh, we have to emphasize again their security and effectiveness, advantages, disadvantages, which are invasive or not invasive, risks and the benefits of each one, how to wear, uh, how long uh, will take uh, the treatment. At this point, we can assess which options might best fit the, that child's lifestyle. Uh, it's interesting to motivate them 
parents and the child to think about which treatment uh, they would like to choose. Uh, so, uh, so uh, how to convince the child to be compliant? So compliance is the key for a good control of myopia. So uh, in my practice, I, when I talk to patients, I consider to listen to them the, the most uh, relevant inform uh, information that they they want to 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 talk, uh, especially the youngers. Try to understand their thoughts, doubts, fear, expectations. Encourage them to adhere to treatment, argue about its benefits and uh, advantages. Uh, we can use uh, analogies, draw pictures to help them to vi vi visualize um, what uh, we are talking about. Uh, let them choose uh, the treatment together with their parents. Uh, and anything goes for an effective communication. And you can also use behavioral tools, any model of efficient approach to for changing attitudes, but keep uh, a dynamic interaction always. Uh, if uh, you are beginning, uh, you can, uh, and you don't have uh, um, enough skills to, to, to talk to parents and, and patients, uh, you can elaborate, prepare um, a practical guide uh, with your own uh, questions. Uh, and if you su suspect that the child didn't understand what you, you said, ask him to repeat the instructions back to you. Effective and efficient communication is critical in healthcare. So uh, talk about, uh, um, sorry. So uh, to recommend modification of environment factors, talk about the evidence linked the, the higher risk of myopia of whom spend less time outdoors and more time in, on digital screens not, uh, at new work. Discuss about the benefits of playing outside, exposing to sunlight, getting more physical activity, running around, riding bikes, moments that will help the physical and the cognitive development of the child. Uh, recommend spend at, uh, at least two hours uh, outdoors a day and show them how to take the 2020 role, taking regular breaks from screens to focus on distant objects. Recommends the guidelines of WTO and pediatric societies worldwide on physical activity, sedentary behavior, and sleep, uh, which habits will also contribute to delay the onset and the uh, myopia progression. So, concluding, education of parents and patients increases awareness of uh, the myopia issue. And this increases more compliance to treatment, ensuring better outcomes. So all efforts should be done to get it. And thus, they will keep good vision and quality of life uh, throughout their lives, avoiding visual impairment secondary to high myopia when they get old. Thank you for attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Naknami, for that wonderful uh, description. How I'm saying that how important it is to educate the parent because whatever we do in terms of uh, you know modalities, educating the parents are very important. Along with, if we can help prevent myopia itself, we call it as pre myops. I think that will go a really long way as the health prevention, uh, the prevention and promotive activities of myopia. I think that's very important. Thank you for highlighting that. Now we'll have for uh, some, we have uh, quite a bit of time for discussion. Today in this webinar, we, we discussed about pharmacological treatment, optical, the preference of the panel and the discussion came, it's almost similar for both except that in very high myopes, in younger patients with high myope and family history, straight away start with, you know, maybe higher dose of atropine or optical therapy 
there is a consensus or agreement towards higher dose of atropine. Sometimes it may not be available in some of the countries, tending towards 2.5%. And uh, Paolo and Celia said that networking with the professionals as well as educating parents are extremely important as we find different uh, strategies. For our eye care professionals, we discussed about the consensus guidelines. They can use it for educating and uh, choosing the treatment. And obviously, we discussed a little bit about the real customization is required when we offer the therapy for individual child. And also, there is a role of combined therapy. I would like to open up the uh, discussion once more now. One of the question uh, on the QA panel, I can see here in the ATOM1 study, this is for Shawe, maybe atropine 0.01% group created a placebo group by the study designers. Were they surprised that 0.01% had the effect it did when you uh, look yes. at the new data retrospectively? Yeah, yeah, Shawe. actually... Uh in atom two, that he's talking about atom two with the 0.01 percent, it was, it was meant more like a, a placebo or as a control. So it was quite. Um, they did not expect it to get the results that it did. So that's true. Yeah, if you look at the responders and non-responders, the placebo and the 0.01 percent is like this, but it does not mean that it did not have an effect. But when you go to 0.01% and 0.5, the responders are much more. As you go down, the response becomes better and better, but provided they have some side effects of pupil dilatations and things like that. Paulo, you are saying something. Sorry, I interrupted yes, you. Possibly the use of atropine that we usually do for cycloplegia is very uh, over treating. So the, the, the dosage of atropine is too much. So atropine works even with lower dosage. Even if uh, uh, with lower dosage, you have an effect. Of course, you don't have the kind of effect of, on, on uh, accommodation. But atropine works uh, at any uh, um, percentage because atropine penetrates the eye and this is demonstrated. And uh, of course, if this is uh, something that uh, happens on the amacrine cells, possibly that kind of dosage, is, it works. So we are used to, to, to um, uh, use uh, atropine uh, in a way that is not possibly the, the, the right way. Atropine works in several different uh, uh, ways. Yeah. Thank you, Paolo. Thanks. Thanks a lot. There, there is one question from Europe. Given the lack of low concentration of atropine in Europe, what do you use for diluting the one percent atropine? Paulo, do you have any suggestion? So to dilate, but we don't dilute know. dilute the atropine. Ah, to dilute. dilute the atropine. We have the possibility. Uh, actually, now we use uh, artificial tears. That is the best way. We use this uh, in the drugstore. There is a uh, a kind of a galenic preparation is done by pharmacy. It costs a little bit more than a normal eye drops, uh, uh, but uh, it works. Okay. It yep. lasts for Thank 30 you. days. It lasts for 30 days, and then you have to, to change the, the, the preparation. This is very important. Go Sorry, ahead. Yeah. Chibi and Go ahead. here. It's very important about atropine, which is because we've been involved in very large. European trials on atropine and had to prove stability. And we discovered, as many people know, that atropine at P neutral P8, as in artificial tears, is actually very unstable. Um, and there's an issue that um, uh, randomly using different dilutants or even sodium, you know, neutral solutions um, can produce solutions which are chemically unstable, which means the atropine will degrade quite fast and increasingly fast at higher temperatures. So there's a real concern about um, sort of pharmacy made preparations that you're not necessarily getting in the bottle what you think you are. Yes, this is true. But at the same time, we try to, 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 to do the best. We were used to, to work <coughs> with prosperin and that we had the same problem. 
but if you maintain the preparation in the uh, lower degrees, uh, under four degrees, it seems to be more stable. And this is what we suggest to the parents. Yeah. Uh, uh, people with the European descent, uh, Paulo, I had a question. The iris uh, pigmentation is, uh, you know, does it influence your dosage? You know, uh, I mean, uh, the concentration of uh, atropine. Do you tend to use lower concentration or higher? I don't Just think so, because we are not working on the muscles. So we are not going to, to, to have a, a response in dilation and on the ciliary body. We are just trying to penetrate into the eye. So the idea is that it works in a different way. Otherwise, why should work in, in the chicken where the, the accommodation is a nicotinic uh, and not muscarinic way? So it works in both. So maybe it's a different way that atropine works. Actually, the, the issue of the, the preparation, we are working, all of us uh, are involved in studies because we want to have a preparation more stable, but at this time, we don't have this. Still, we have good results. So <laughs> we don't know, but we have good results. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there are similar questions by many. This is an open question for all the panelists. Uh, What's the earliest age you start the anti-myopia strategy? And what is the latest age you start it? And what's your first option? I'll start with Carly. Carly, you should open Carly, the microphone. Uh, could you please unmute? I think it varies from individuals because there are many factors involved, the parental myopia, the environment, whether there have been history of fast myopia progression. So, uh, I mean, change in refractive error. So I, I, I think um, as long as we identify a pre myope of about maybe 0.75 diopter, we should be really alert to advise the parents that some kind of myopia management is necessary. And the oldest, I don't think there is also <laughs> a fixed age. In Asia, there are many adults continue to have increase in their myopia up to 30 years old. In our university clinic, we see a lot of this. And so some of these adults, we also use those uh, Build smart lens, um, and they also can help a little bit, but not as effective as in the young children. Okay, or do you show me your um, preference? Yeah, so um, as like if even if they are very young, I do start them. Um, like I said, I look at the chart. So my own son, I started him when he was three years old. Um, he had risk factors and all that. So um, yeah, so three. And at the other ex the extreme, as long as they progress, and I do remind parents and actually patients that they have to be patient with us because we do know from the COMET trials, especially that only 50% stabilize at age 15. So it's a really a long road that, that, that the other end, um, they can be continuing. They need the myopia control for a longer time. So as long as they're progressing, even they are much older, they need to, they need to continue the drops uh, or the treatment, whatever they are on. My yeah. idea, Ramesh, that in Europe we are a bit different because it's very rare to, to find a, a high myopic child. Actually, high myopia in very young children is something stable in our um, meridian and parallel. So the idea is that we, we start at least at six years and we must see that there is an increase in myopia because if you have a seven diopters and you start, you don't even know if this is a growing myopia or is a stable myopia. We have still a, a, a group of patients that have very high myopia from the beginning. So uh, uh, we don't start so early. Um, at the same time, uh, obviously, we start to discuss with the parents about the possibility of an increase. But I think we are dealing with the two different population. Europe is different from, from, uh, from the West can Western country. 
or on a way yeah. of Eastern Canada. Your perspective. So you look for me is Ian, is it? Um, yeah, so I think important points there. So um, in relation to very young kids, Paolo says that you know, before six, you know, the proportion of myopes in the population is, is less than 1%. Um, one useful rule of thumb is if a kid has more diopters than years in their, their life, I, you know, you know, more than four diopters to four-year-old, or more than six to up to six year old, um, you have to assume they're going to be a genetic cause until proven otherwise. And I think you know detailed um, evaluation is, is really critical for those. Um, but the uh, in, in a more simple sort of you know younger onset myope um, in a myopic family, whatever age you you get them, but it's likely to be over six. Um, and the other end, exactly as Paula says, is that in in Europe we have much later onset and much more later progression. So. Um, the issue is all the trials happens, you know, recruited kids under 16. So uh, I do think there's a lot of um, progressing myopes over 16 who should be treated off label um, in Europe. So Ramesh, I would like to I, go ahead. I ask to everybody a question that is for me, for myself, is uh, how do you manage to track these myopic patients? Because do you trust the, the subjective visual acuity or you trust more the axial length or cycloplegia? Because in, in my place where I uh, you know, prescribe all this treatment, I still trust very much to subjective uh, uh, visual acuity. If I have a child that is 20-20 of vision, six on six, 10 on 10, and uh, the, I still see a kind of in, increase, a light increase in axial length, or I have a 0 0.50 of myopia and the cycloplegia well done with the cyclopentrate and whatever. I do still trust subjective, and I consider that child stable if the visual acuity is stable. Is this your position or not? Quick answers, please. We have to move on. Yeah. First, Ian, you want to answer? Yeah. So, well, I would do, you know, subjective refractions for older kids is what I'll, that, that's what dictates the glasses. I will still rely on um, cyclopedic refraction as uh, a, a, a core benchmark. Um, and axial length, once you ac account for uh, physiological growth, is still my ultimate benchmark of success. Thanks. Shori? Yeah, I definitely check the visual acuities, definitely cyclo refraction and axial length. And, and just an addition, when I talk about like we start on a, um, a young child with high myopia, we meant that high according to the chart for his age, not like a high, high minus six sort of high, you know, like I'm referring to, to the percentile chart. And these are, these are young kids that are the regular sort of um, school going myopia, so not the pathological with, with, with uh, systemic disease. Yeah. So just, just to clarify that point. But Kali. definitely cycle refraction and axial length. Thanks. Kali? Same here. Okay. Uh, Lilia, do you want to add anything else? Or we are not able to hear you. She's Unfortunately, muted. we have to move on because of the time factor. Uh, I will go to the poll questions now. Uh, the first question is, based on your, you have learned today, how confident are you now in your ability to manage and treat myopia progression in a patient younger than eight years old? That's the number one question. Uh, I would just give 15 seconds. So I can see the results, very confident, 35%, somewhat confident, 64%. Now it's 38%, very confident, 40%, very confident. It's, it's hovering between uh, 38 and 40. Uh, let's move on to the next question. The second question, based on what you have learned today, how confident are you now in your ability to manage and treat myopia progression in the age group between eight and 12 years of age? Very confident, somewhat confident, neither or not confident at all. Oh. 
So more than 95%, 98%, I can see very confident or somewhat confident. Uh, just 2% not confident yet. So that's wonderful to know. That's excellent. I will go to the next question. Based on today's learning, how strong your understanding about the latest treatment options for myopia management, including bifocals, PALS, and pharmaceutical uh, options? 15 seconds. Okay. Very strong understanding, 25%, moderate understanding, close to 30%, strong understanding, close to 50, 48%. That's uh, good to know. Let me move to the last question for today. How significantly do you believe what you have learned today has improved your ability to manage myopia progression in children in your practice? Very significantly, significantly, somewhat significantly, no change. This is very fast. I already see significantly 40%, 42%, very significantly 40%, somewhat significant uh, 18%. So, yeah, 80% uh, of them, it's significantly improved, 82%. So that ends the uh, ARS. Really, thank you, all the speakers. Dr. Carly Lam, Ian Flitcroft, Paul Onucci, Shaw Elio, and Celia Naknami. Thank you so much. We would like to thank our gold level supporter, SLR Luxottica, bronze level Cooper Vision, and uh, silver level supporter, Hoya. Uh, it was wonderful having you all. Thank you for sparing this. Uh, 120 minutes for us and more in preparing these lectures. And it was truly, truly helpful for all our delegates. We would meet again. We would answer all these questions in another webinar in a couple or maybe a month's time or so. And we will get back to all the answers. Thank you so much once again. Have a very good evening or good night or good day to all of you, wherever you are. Thank you so much. A big namaste to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.